It's time to take a ride on the Steelers afternoon drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome in to another episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith, as always, joined by Alan Saunders. And as always, on Friday, DB, Steelers DB, Derek Bell joining the show. How are we doing, DB? Doing well. How are you guys doing? I um, want to take a moment to make sure that I okay. tell the listeners that I did change my prediction last week. I picked the Steelers to lose on the podcast, but I had a come to Jesus moment about 20 minutes before the game on Sunday. Yeah, okay. And I switched my pick. Not only did I switch my pick, but I did it in a public forum. You can go back and look at the tweets. Smitty can pull it All up. Right. Um, so I just I want to let you guys know that I had a come to Jesus moment and the Steelers won. So maybe that's what we need to do going forward is I need to pick against them on the pod, switch my pick last minute, and that will ensure a victory. Whatever we got to do. I But further, I will not be pulling that up. I'm because I want the people here to still be maybe left in the dust a little bit in terms of <laughs> if that actually happened. Uh, if they don't, I mean, who's watching or listening to the show doesn't follow you on your Twitter anyway. So those people probably all saw it. I actually, you know, I, I'll be honest, I missed that happening. Uh, I wasn't going to roast you for it on here, being the only one to predict wrong. But, and we were all in the same ballpark in terms of the score, too. And yet we got people in the comments telling us to stop predicting stuff and just report stuff because we're so bad at it. The bold predictions, maybe, but there's a reason that we call them bold. I was so. gonna say, like, what what do you want us to predict? I mean I was <laughs> off by two freaking points. Yeah. <laughs> I was off by three. I mean, do they think we've got a crystal ball? I with a crystal yeah. ball, I could still be off by two points. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Anyways, uh Alan, how are we feeling? I'm good, man. I'm good. Uh we got something new brewing for Saturday, fired up about. Mm-hmm. And are you still uh, not gonna so just going to leave that out there like that? By the end of the show. By the end of the show. I'll... Okay. <laughs> no, I, actually, no, that's good. I like that. Make sure we get all that watch time. People got to stay yeah. the entire way through and not just watch. To find out about our, yeah. new, our new podcast on Saturday. Yeah, there we go. So be sure to stay tuned for that. But let's uh, let's dive into this a little bit, as we always do on a Friday of a game week. Steelers-Ravens, first official game for the Steelers of the season. And it couldn't be any bigger than this. Whoever wins this game will currently sit atop of the AFC North. Um, so it's not necessarily for all the marbles, but it is for the time being. Uh, anyways, but there's some injury stuff, I guess, that we can touch on. Alan, I brought up the Jalen Warren thing yesterday. Obviously concerned any time that you, you know, have an injury like that pop up late in the week. Uh, dealing with a back issue. They listed him as limited today, but there's even, you know, you were able to put up a clip of him not doing much in terms of the drills and stuff like that. I uh, don't feel good about Jalen Warren's availability for Sunday. Jalen Warren is a tough dude, and I give him a lot of credit for being willing to play through just about anything. But, I mean, the way that he was moving around out there and not doing anything, even in individual periods, I have a hard time seeing him playing on Sunday. I would assume that either he is out or he is going to play at a v- way less than 100%, which I just don't see as smart when you have a short week the following week and guys like Aaron Shamplin and Jonathan Ward have been fairly reliable when called upon on the practice squad mm-hmm. and Cordero Patterson back um, you know, to full health now. So it's not like they're in some sort of crisis at the running back position where you feel like you have to do that. I think I'd be pretty surprised if Jalen Warren plays this week. So. I'll kick it to Derek for this one then, because even though I feel like we haven't seen Jalen Warren, he's the offense's version this year of Alex Highsmith. What a frustrating year it's got to be for him with just injuries seemingly stacking on top of each other. We haven't seen Jalen Warren beat Jalen Warren at the same time, and maybe it's just coincidental, 7-0 and in games he's played, 0-2 and in games he has not played. Um, what does he bring to this team that they will not ha- have on Sunday, assuming that he's not able to go? And how do you kind of find a way to at least in some way replace that? Yeah, I mean, a, a little bit different running style, but I think the big thing, uh, just the reliability is like a check down option. Uh, we saw like the nice play that he made last week. Uh, Russ found him on a third down. He was able to pick up a, uh, I think it was a pretty big chunk play on third and down to keep a drive alive. Um, the commanders dropped the coverage. And I think that's really like one of the things that I think Warren does better. Um, maybe then Harris is like just getting out of, out of the backfield. It always seems like uh, those checkdowns go for a good amount of yardage whenever he does get the ball. He had a huge play was the Jets game where he made a couple guys miss um, short of the sticks and then got the first down and then pass protection too. Like I think he's 
probably the most reliable of the three. I don't think any of their backs are necessarily like a liability by any stretch in pass protection. I think Warren brings a little bit more thunder, though, um, on blitzers. I think he scans the, scans the box pretty well. So, I, But I, I will point this out. Like, they did play Cordero Patterson a little bit on um, – in passing situations last week, he had a really key blitz pickup on the first touchdown to Pickens. So it's not like, I mean, mm-hmm. Patterson's a two hundred and thirty pound dude too. So like they've got some guys back there that could kind of fill that role. But like you said, just a really frustrating season overall. Like for him, for High Smith, um, just because you know I think those were guys that we obviously had pretty high expectations for coming into the season. Just like nothing's falling their way, right? Pretty frustrating um, too if you're uh, the, the you know in the Pittsburgh Steelers front office, and I don't know if this is what their grand plan was, but if the grand plan was, hey, you know, we think both Najee Harris and Jalen Warren are really good options right now, but we think we can get Jalen Warren for way cheaper going forward. So let Najee ride off into the sunset and then hand things over to Jalen Warren in 2025. Man, that that plan's not going real well. Between Warren being banged up a bunch and and Najee playing the best football of his career, I don't know. That looked like a pretty attractive option as of about the middle of this summer. I'm not sure it does anymore. Um, I don't know what they're going to do, but I, I would have been on board with that plan before the start of this season. And I'm not sure how you can look at what's happened in the first half of this season and say, yes, that's what the Steelers should do going forward here. My bold prediction for the week is that the Steelers' lead back for next year is going to come out of the NFL draft. Oh. Someone asked me, so someone asked me that yesterday. What I thought of the Jalen Warren injury, and like, I'm sorry, I guess this is just the way that my brain's working already. But the first thing I thought about was just how early the Steelers are going to take it back next year. I, I'll be pretty surprised, like just the way things sit right now. Like, I think they're going to take it back probably in like the second round. So that would be that'd be my prediction. Is like. I think Warren is still – I think he is going to be here because, like you said, I think he's he's mm-hmm. a restricted free agent. He'll be cheaper uh, than Harris will – what Harris will get on the open market, especially with the way that he's played over the past month or so. Um, but I, I just think that this running back class is pretty deep. they got a lot of good talent, so I think that they'll be able to go get, like, a, another 1A or 1B kind of guy um, to kind of pair with Warren in the short term and then, you know, kind of move forward with that. I think yeah. they've scouted Quinshawn Judkins and Travion Henderson four times in person. Caleb Johnson, that's the dude from that Iowa. One, he's been there, and um, guy from Oklahoma State's pretty good too. Ollie, yeah, Gordon. Ollie Gordon, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Ashton Genty's probably the one we're going to talk about. Like, you know, did they he take a running back too high? No, no, no. That's what I'm saying. Like, he's going to be the one that goes so high. We're going to be like, you mm-hmm. know, a team taking a running back in the top ten, and. We're going to be really questioning it. So uh, anyways, but other than uh, the Jalen Warren injury, also Michael Pruitt's as doubtful, which like, do we even need to have doubtful as a, as a tag still anymore? Like questionable, I feel like you could just be, because doubtful is going to be out. When does doubtful ever end up playing unless they're upgraded beforehand, right? Jalen Warren played as doubtful earlier this year. And he was, uh, but wasn't he upgraded questionable before he ended up playing? It wasn't uh, like he went from maybe, doubtful to maybe, maybe. Yeah. So I feel like it's never a guy that's on a doubtful tag that ends up playing. But anyway, like doubtful is basically just we're waiting one more day to decide whether you're questionable or out. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's fair. Anyways, Michael Pruitt. They're always going to either doubtful. upgrade them or downgrade them the next day if they're doubtful. I would. I would say. Okay. Uh, I right. would be pretty surprised if Michael Pruitt plays as well. I talked to him very briefly today. He said it is the same knee injury as the first time around, which is mm. not what I wanted to hear. Uh, he mm. missed. Five weeks that time, four weeks. Yeah, hurt um, week two. Yeah, came back for the Jets game. So, yeah, so what seven? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I would think not this week then. Um, just by that, um, and then we'll see about next week going forward. Okay. Um, Nick Herbig, good to go. Cor- oh, they Corey Trice, well. I think they're going to play either. Like Matt Sokol's on the practice squad, but I, yeah. I don't really think they need like. Connor Hayward's fine. I think they're fine at tight end. I think they'll use. That oh, okay. Run. Wait. So should we so, up, should we update the the helmet math that we were trying to figure out throughout the week in terms? Well, right. Of- like if you're looking for a way to get Braden Fajoko involved, I think you could do it that way. But I think and maybe that's maybe they'll dress seven corners and maybe Corey Trice comes off the IR without yeah. having to scratch someone. Okay. Yeah. So Corey Trice, I just brought up as questionable 
he, we feel like he's going to be good to go. Nick Herbert is good to go. No designation. Same with Dante Jackson. Um, CJ Henderson, not going to play, but he hasn't played yet. Somebody asked about him actually this week, though. Um, going on so, the IR with that neck injury, I would think, yeah. too, in the building at all this week. Uh, it I would agree. not, like Corey Trice to me is healthy. The question is just whether or not they're going to bring him off IR. Okay. So, um, and on the Ravens side of things, uh, former friend Art Millette out. Uh, was in a boot yesterday with that injury, now rolled out. Uh, and then Travis Jones, questionable. But I think he's been dealing with that. Is it his ankle? I'm pretty sure I saw people saying like he's been dealing with that ankle for a couple of weeks now and just playing through it. Um, but that would obviously be a pretty impactful one if he's not able to go for whatever reason. If I was taking a guess right now, I think he will. But uh, that would be pretty impactful if he doesn't go. Yeah, Jones has been Jones has had a really strong season. Uh, kind of looks like the player that I kind of thought he would be coming out of college. It seems like the Ravens always have like a knack for, I mean, not just like developing their own guys, but I feel like their defensive linemen, like that, or in the edge rushers, always like once they hit like year three, year four, it seems like that's when they kind of find their stride. I know Metabike was kind of a similar dude that kind of broke out maybe a little bit later than people were anticipating. And it turns into like, you know, a star level player that they end up having to break the bank for. So, yeah, I mean, if he couldn't go, that would be obviously pretty pretty significant especially with the way that baltimore's played against the run this year he's a really strong dude at the point of attack mm-hmm. yeah, Kyle Anderson about this. playing is the big deal um for yeah me. for sure he had been limited uh it had that ankle injury on thursday night missed the second half against the Bengals. uh said it was a quick return but he feels good i uh, don't know if he's going to be 100 percent, but um he's so by leaps and bounds the best player in the baltimore secondary and i think um, really presents some difficult matchup problems for the Steelers. I don't think the Steelers slot receivers are guys that should feel real confident against, about winning against Kyle Hamilton very often. They also use him as a safety. Um, I, I think he's kind of a very important chess piece over there. Yeah, absolutely. Derek, I don't know if you have anything to add about Kyle Hamilton, but we're going to get into some key matchups here shortly anyways, and maybe he'll figure into those plans. Uh, Alan, was there anything else that you wanted to touch on before we do go to this game itself? Uh, you know what? I did. I got a question that has nothing to do with this game, so we'll get hmm. to it now. St- from okay. a Steelers fan, FL, uh, who is from Florida, uh, and she's a regular uh, member of the audience here, said, what if any f- has the what if effect, if any, has the filming of Hard Knocks had on the Steelers? Curious about this. Mm. Curious about this. Um, and and uh, I just want to say none because they haven't started yet. They they are not recording. Oh, no, they're not even there yet. Week before they mm. air, so they're not starting until after the Browns game. So the Jeez. sum of the effect of the filming of Hard Knocks on the Steelers has been that we lost eight pre- uh, parking spaces for their production trailer. And if you're mm-hmm. familiar with the way things work on the south side, those are those are quite kind of necessary a- parking spaces. So yeah. it has led to some some tension and some early uh, arrivals for the non Pittsburgh Steelers playing uh, portion of the south side crew. But uh, other than that, no effect whatsoever to this point. I, see, I would have thought that they would have wanted, you know, some film of this upcoming, like this week leading into this game and stuff. Like, but I guess that's just part of the agreement, right? They can't, they can't be filming it yet. I don't so. know what the agreement is. I do know that uh, I was talking to Angela Steelers uh, PR person. She said there's, they're asking for like some off the field stuff with the players and things like that. And so they're working on the show, just not no footage. Okay. Of right. Gotcha. All right, well, let's dive into this game, then, and what we can see, actually, is the on-field product of this game. Uh, as always, we talked about some key matchups on both sides of the ball, and then we'll get into some predictions, despite you know some people in the comments maybe not being the big fan of those predictions. But anyway, uh, let's get into some key matchups. Uh, Derek, we'll start with you. What do you think is like the one matchup as we look at the Ravens' offense going into Steelers' defense that would determine the way that this thing's going to go? Yeah, I mean, I think the chess match between... Todd Monken and Tara Austin slash Mike Thomas is going to be like probably the thing that I'm looking forward to the most. I'm just really curious about like how they play Lamar. Um, if you look at like the the game last year and just like the way that they played him, uh, I think there's there's the narrative around it is that the Steelers defense has always like kind of owned Lamar. And I think for the first couple of times that they played, uh, especially at the level of ball that Lamar was playing at the time of the game, like that was true. 
last year I don't really think that that was actually the case. I went back and watched that game earlier this week just to like make sure that I was wasn't going crazy. But Lamar was pretty good last year when he played the Steelers. It's just everybody else was really bad. I mean, they had like seven, seven or drops. eight. Mark they had like had two. Yeah, they had like seven or eight passes just go right off their hands. I mean, some of these were like huge plays. So um, I thought he was good. Um, the red zone interception they threw to Porter was terrible. Like that ball was yeah. like horribly placed. But other than that, like he was he was pretty good. Like, but I think um, you know just the matchup between like how they play him. You know, last year if you look at some of the numbers, like they only played zone coverage on seven snaps <laughs> against uh, the Ravens last year, which is kind of crazy when mm-hmm. you think about um just the amount of man coverage that they played i mean obviously um the ravens are seeing a lot of man coverage this year and one of the things that's kind of been like a saving grace for them is like rashad bateman's like played pretty well as they flowers is like continued to ascend and then they went out and traded for deontay johnson so they've got like three guys that you would consider in that like man beater bucket um so you know I will say, like, the one thing that concerns me most on film in terms of, like, matchups is that the Steelers' DBs, like, corners specifically, did not play that well against Washington. I thought they got bailed out by some bad throws, um, and I thought the pass rush kind of uplifted them, which could be the case this week as well. Um, But particularly out of the slot, like, Zay Flowers, they love to, like, pepper him with these deep crossers uh, in the intermediate area of the field. Lamar's a really accurate, like, touch thrower in that area, and – Cam Sutton just looked like he couldn't run anymore last week, just to be, be completely blunt. So I'm just curious about like what the game plan is uh, for Austin to kind of mitigate some of those issues. Yeah, I think part of it is the pass rush, right? They, he wasn't great last year, year, but he certainly was better than like his stat line should, you know, because of those drops. But the interception and then the four sacks, they really kept, and, and then the Ravens couldn't run the ball. And so yep. the Steelers kept him in obvious passing situations and I because they couldn't run the ball. And then, you know, they were able to get to Lamar Jackson, create negativity. Um, you know, I, I think this is a game where it almost you know matters as much how they stop Derrick Henry as it does Lamar Jackson because Derrick Henry is good enough that you don't need Lamar Jackson to be Lamar. You just – you just turn him into Ryan Tannehill and you can still win games, right? Like that, like you don't need him to go be this like crazy playmaker. I'm with you on the zone man stuff. I'm a little concerned about the matchup between what I assume is going to be Bateman and Dante Jackson. I'm not sure that one in man coverage is one that I love for the Steelers. Um, I'm also a little concerned about the, like where Deonte Johnson fits in. I, I like, I, I don't know. The Steelers do not have a bunch of man cover dudes. Like they just don't. They have Joey Porter and friends. And I don't know if the friends are up to the task of Bateman, Johnson, uh, Talon Wallace had, went off for this huge game uh, against the Bengals. And is certainly a guy that can do that to you if you're not paying attention. And then all the tight ends, you know, are the Steelers going to play a bunch of a Landon Roberts and a bunch of base defense? Because if they are, and I'm the Ravens, then I'm going to try to make them cover Isaiah Likely. Like, there's, that's the to me, that's the way. If I'm the Baltimore, I'm going to punish the Steelers mm-hmm. for loading up the box against Derrick Henry. They have three tight ends that they throw to. They're all pretty good. Even Charlie Kolar is like not, not a scrub. I, I think they have. I, I, I just look. I too many offensive weapons. I, I don't, I don't see how the Steelers. Like shut the like they the Ravens scored ten points in the game in Pittsburgh last year. I just I can't mm-hmm. even like even if the receivers drop every pass, I can't see how that could happen. <laughs> right, yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, it's like Steelers defense versus Baltimore offense. I don't even know if this is necessarily key. It's just like what I'm looking forward to watching because of all the chatter around it. I think that these two guys have obviously had this one circled. Is Patrick Queen to Sean Elliott going against this offense and the way that they're going to make their impacts felt? Because oh, yeah. I feel like. Both of them uh, have said a lot this week in a lot of different directions, uh, taking two different approaches towards this week, I feel like. And those are two guys that have obviously just like the air has been pointing up for Patrick every single week, definitely coming off his best game as a Steeler against Washington. And Deshaun's been awesome all season. But I think this one is really the one where like you start to think like these are where these personalities come out. This is where the hatred's going to flow. And these two are ready to put their stamp on this rivalry from the other side yeah. now. So, so yeah, that's where I'm at. 
I will say too, like kind of what Alan was saying just about Derrick Henry. I'm interested to see, mm-hmm. you know, previously I wrote about this for Steelers now. So you can go, you guys can go read like the full piece if you want, but um, just how they play like that relationship, especially like with the gun run stuff. Uh, they do a lot of like zone read, like in previous matchups, they like charge the mesh point, just like run straight at Lamar, hit him as much as they can and like force him to hand the ball off. Obviously that's a little bit different. Like when it's Derrick Henry um, rather than like Gus Edwards, and friends as Alan would say. Um, so, I mean, that's going to be key. And then also like, there are ways to like kind of make them a little bit one dimensional, which Alan talked about as well, like down the stretch in the game last year, the Steelers pass rush kind of came alive a little bit. And the edge rusher starts to take over. Um, Ronnie Stanley's more healthy this year. He looks like a completely different player in my eyes. So like, that's definitely something worth noting. Uh, but the Steelers want to make, um, I mean, as cliche as it sounds, they want to try to make them as one dimensional as possible. I actually think like when we can kind of use this as a segue, I actually think it's really important for the Steelers offense to get off to a good start in this one. Um, because you know, creating negative plays like on first down is going to be big. Um, but Henry is a guy who like, he gets better and better. Like as the game goes on, like that's a cliche for all running backs. It's not necessarily always true. Uh, but you even look at like Henry's numbers like this year. Uh, Cause I looked it up. Like after I watched like a couple games of film, I was like, dude, like he's not doing much in the first half of these games. I mean, he was averaging 4.9 yards per carry, which like still is pretty good for most running backs. But then you get to the second half and it skyrockets up to seven. So it's like seven yards per carry in the second half. So you've got to worry about like Lamar back here dancing and scrambling and running around all the time. And then you got a 235 pound or, well, he's probably like 250, I guess, uh, battery Ram. Yeah. Uh, that you got to go try and tackle in the fourth quarter. So like, I think like getting off to a good start, getting some negative plays on first down to get him off the field on second and third down to make those passing situations is key. Uh, but just like, trying to get a lead like it would be awesome if like they could come out in the first quarter and like kind of just get up like 10 points not to say that the Ravens are going to abandon the run because they probably won't but if they can make them a little bit more pass happy um I think that you know kind of makes them a little bit less dangerous yeah absolutely well that you you said uh starting to segue there towards you know Steelers offense versus Baltimore defense Alan what do you think about that matchup and what would be the keys to that well, I talked about uh, one on the morning rush this morning. I think they, you know, Roquan Smith is an all pro and I like Trent Simpson a lot, but those guys are not covering very well right now. And I don't know why, but I, if I'm the Steelers, I'm not going to look that gift horse in the mouth and I'm going to throw to Pat Farmuth a whole bunch. Um, I don't think the Ravens secondary is very good, but I think over the middle is where it can be beaten. Um, not to say that George won't get his deep balls and Mike Williams too, but like the Ravens have given those up all year long. Their numbers are horrendous um, in the middle of the field and against tight ends. I think the seventh most uh, fantasy points against the tight ends, which obviously is not a real stat, but gives you some indication of what the damage has been done and and, and from who. Sure. I really like Friermuth in this one. I really like Darnell Washington in this one, especially without Jalen Warren. You know, that would be the other guy I would think if you're looking to punish linebackers that are struggling with coverage. Like the big thing for me is I just don't understand why this Ravens defense is this bad. I look at the players and I'm, I don't know. I don't know if it's the play calling. Obviously they lose Mike McDonald to the Seattle head coach. Uh, if it, if it's, you know, some guys getting a little, obviously Marlon Humphrey's a little bit older now. Kyle Van Noy was older before he got to Baltimore. Uh, are they just deteriorating? I, I can't really figure it out because I, I like the players on paper, but the results are not very pretty. Derek, do you have a take on that? Uh, of course. Yeah. I mean, uh, for one, like Alan said, it's it's I think some of the names on the Baltimore defense just aren't playing up to the caliber of all that like we're used to seeing them play. Uh, you mentioned Roquan, like that's been a hot topic. Roquan to me looks like a step, a full step slower than he did last year. Like for whatever reason, like Roquan's always been a pretty athletic dude dating back to college. He's always been a guy that was like kind of a multifaceted player could, could play pretty well in coverage. I think he's been a little bit overrated in coverage like recently, but um, this year they haven't been covering anybody in the middle of the field. Like you mentioned it, like any statistic you pull from the middle of the field completions, um, it's pretty much have your way. And then on the back end, like it's not as bad on film as it looks um, on you know, the num- from a numbers or a statistical standpoint. But at the same time, like, they've got guys that, like, just aren't playing very good football. Like, Marcus Williams looks completely washed. I have no idea how that even works because last year and at times like the year before, like, he's had str- struggles staying healthy. But he was playing with one arm last year, and he was actually playing pretty good ball. 
he looks terrible this year. Like they gave up a huge deep post uh, last week and Brandon Stevens, who like was a guy that the Ravens and everybody I felt like in film Twitter was pretty excited about as a guy that was going to mm-hmm. continue to ascend in a, I think a contract year. And uh, like they're playing quarters and like he gets a deep post and like the ball's in the air. He just stops running. And it's like, what are you doing? Like that, that's your, that's your guy. Like, why are you, why are you jogging? But you just look at like throws like over 20 air yards on the season. Um, the Ravens have given up 22 completions. That's the most in the NFL, 698 yards, second most in the NFL, six touchdowns, second most in the NFL. So, I mean, like it's just been bombs away on this defense. I actually think like the, like Humphreys actually had a solid season, uh, has had a nice bounce back because I thought he was pretty bad last year, actually. Um, and but and like Nate Wiggins, like when he's played, has been like a guy that's been in tight coverage, but like they've got him with some DPI penalties. He's obviously like 165 pounds soaking wet, so there's some limitations there, and he's just a rookie corner. So um, I don't know, man. Like it's it's really it's not just Mike McDonald leaving because they're doing a lot of the same stuff. Like it's not like a carbon copy with Zach Core, um, but it has been really troubling and people have been able to do pretty much whatever they wanted through the air, but they have stopped the run. Well, they're number one in the NFL and rushing success rate by a large margin. Like mm, they had okay. like pretty much no one has ran the ball on them this year. Well, that's what I was going to go to next was because that you said success rates so that changed things for me because the question was going to be, do you think that they have are, are number one against the run just because, you know, they're so easy to get through the air. Well, you don't even have to try to run against them, but if it's a success rate, they've actually been good. Yeah, I mean, which kind of makes sense. Like when you look at the when you just like look at the numbers, like on like first down rushing success rate, um, their defense is at like twenty nine point four percent. Like they're just they're putting you in like third down situations where you're having to throw the ball. Um, it's been really difficult to like run the ball on them all season long. If you like expand that just to like all downs, uh, I'm pretty sure they're first. Yeah, they're they're first at thirty point seven. So it really doesn't matter. Like first down, second down, third down. No one's ran the ball on them th- this year. Um, all that effectively. And I will say this too, like one of the things about the Ravens that kind of surprised me a little bit. And like the only reason I thought about it was because I went back and watched that Bengals game a little bit, which is a great game, by the way. Um, And I was like, they're kind of teeing off on Burrow and Burrow's making some crazy throws, but I'm like, the Bengals offensive line can sometimes be a little sketchy. So that's probably not a great margin, Um, but the Bengals or the Ravens pass rush on third down has been pretty good recently. So that's just something to keep an eye on, especially because, um, I don't know. The Steelers didn't run the ball effectively last week against a Washington front who literally could not figure out how they wanted to align. Like they they routinely lined up without guys and gaps. And I have no idea how the Steelers could take more of an advantage of it. Um, but this Ravens defense is a totally different monster up front. So I'm just kind of curious, like if the Steelers do have to throw the ball, the idea behind the whole Russell Wilson thing is like you want him to be on like this low volume pitch count. I'm just really curious on like, how that looks and if they're going to be able to hold up in pass protection, if they do have to kind of like true pass it more. I noticed that about the Ravens and hitting Burrow too. And I looked this up. So uh, these are pro football reference numbers. Ravens are uh, fourth lowest percentage of hurries. Okay. So 22 mm-hmm. times they've been credited with a hurry this season, um, but lead the league in quarterback hits with 43. So like, they're they're just they're just teeing off anyway, and like you know, getting there a second late all the time. Um, but I think that's an interesting thing that I I picked up on too is just how many times they're putting Joe Burrow on the ground. Um, we need a couple like, rough on the pass penalties on Sunday, Russ. Yeah, <laughs> on that extra, you gotta. Well, I mean, well, how's a thirty-five year old going to handle that? Phys- I mean, forty-three. Yeah. That's that's five times a game, four and a half times a game. I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they're, you know, they're obviously they're, they're upper tier. They have 31 sacks. They have the fourth most sacks. So they're getting the quarterback. Um, mm-hmm. But I thought that was an interesting disparity, right? Where like so very few hurries and all these hits uh, mm-hmm. adding up. I, I thought that was interesting too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, anything from either side of the ball for either team before we get into our predictions? Mm. You can go ahead, Alan. I'm looking up a stat that I think I, I think I want to shout out, but I just want to verify that it's actually true. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the uh, I think the Steelers have a large advantage in special teams. Uh, I, I don't think hmm. the Baltimore special okay. teams are particularly good this year. Justin and Tucker's wash. Say it. Say it, Justin Alan. Justin Tucker <laughs> is. I will say this has not been nearly as good as Chris Boswell has been this year. Um, 
Mm-hmm. And and so uh, you know, that's kind of been the one part about this game that's always scary is you kick the ball off and two first downs later they're kicking a field goal. I'm not mm-hmm. sure they have that right now. So uh yeah, I think there's a pretty heavy special teams advantage towards Pittsburgh. Uh Pat Fryermuth, by the way, less than four targets per game so far this season. I would like to see that go up. Okay. Oh, Actually, screw my stat. Uh, can I get on my soapbox real quick about Farmers? Okay. Yeah. So, so we like Pat. Pat's a good dude. Friend of the show. Friend of Smitty. Yeah. Friend of mine. But at the same time, I'm continually befuddled by the way that they are using him in this offense. And it's it's kind of starting to get under my skin a little bit. They designed multiple plays last week for Darnell Washington, who I think, like, Everybody who follows me on anything, like y'all know, like I am a huge number 80 fan. I appreciate the things that he does in the run game. I think that he's one of the most unique players in the National Football League. That being said, I don't necessarily think that you have to go out and design three, four plays for him every week. And if you are going to, can we do the same to number 88 who you just gave this big contract to? Please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Like last week in particular, there were multiple plays up until the fourth quarter where they're getting man coverage looks and Russ's eyes are going over the middle to tight ends on crossers. And it's to Darnell Washington and to to Michael Pruitt. The first one to Pruitt's a little bit low and behind, but he doesn't create a lot of separation. Anyway, Washington's throw. Later one, this is Pruitt and he's wide open. Yeah. (laughs) And he does like the one to Washington, like doesn't get there either. So it's like, why, why is that not? And Friday's on the sidelines. So it's like, I went back and watched. I'm like, is he tapping out? Like, why is he going to the sideline? Is he, is he tired? Like, is this a formational thing? But they had a couple plays last week where they were at 11 personnel and Pruitt was the only tight end on the field. And I'm just like continually confused. Like what, like why, what world would you want that to be the case? Like no offense to Michael Pruitt. who's like, he's a fine player, but like, he's not Pat Fryermuth. And then in the fourth quarter, um, you know, they're trying to keep the drive alive like right before the Mike Williams touchdown. I think it's like third and three. They run like an artist concept, which is like a little follow. And they have Fryer with run the run the shallow cross over the middle of the field. And what do you know? He gets open, Russ hits him, and they convert on third down. So, like, it's just like some of those things. Like, why didn't why didn't we do that earlier in the game? Like, instead of chucking these like go balls and stuff, like contested catch situations to Calvin Austin and Van Jefferson, like, why don't we use the tight end? Like, I gotta just so, some of the stuff, some of the usage stuff in the Washington game in particular made very little sense to me from a play calling perspective. And you guys know, like I'm, I'm fair with that stuff. I I've been pretty complimentary of, of Arthur Smith, but um, yeah, just strange, some strange decisions from a personnel standpoint last week, in my opinion. I feel like Pat's catches have like just disprop- like, he, what does he have? Like 30 catches, uh, 34, 30, 34, I think. 20, and they're 29. not they're not throwing the ball a ton, so like no, he might be thirty four. But like all twenty nine yeah. of those have been important. I think <laughs> like yeah. like every single one has been either like a big play or a crucial first down or a touchdown or like like he's not getting like and, and it's just like that's there more than that. Like it just seems like for whatever reason they've been hesitant. Maybe they don't want to overdo it. I do think there has been some intentionality. Like I remember watching this team in training camp all year and you put stuff in your head like they do this they do this they do this they do this and then i'm like some of that stuff i have not seen since training camp and it's Mm -hmm. like okay well did they just scrap that because somebody got hurt or whatever or are they really saving some stuff for the second half of the season with the division schedule as unbalanced as it as it is and i really do think that that's part of it they have been holding some stuff back that they already have installed, that they're like, no, no, wait, giving that to Baltimore, giving that to Cincinnati, giving that to Cleveland. We don't want them to see it ahead of time. Yeah, I hope so. That's certainly the hope for me. Um, all right, let's get into some predictions then. Uh, of course, bold predictions will play into this still, despite what the comments want. We're still going to do that. Um, hmm, who started last week? I don't remember. I think now Derek made Allen, I think. So, Derek, you got to start this week. Yeah, I, I actually have a uh, my bold prediction. And again, yeah. like people in the comments, like, I understand this is a bold prediction. Like, chill out. Yeah, we're trying to make ourselves look like geniuses where there's like no backlash if we don't get it yeah. right or wrong. Yeah, it's bold. Um, my bold prediction is that ah, crap. I meant to look this up before I got on. Um, my bold prediction is that George Pickens has a 50 yard reception and scores 
this week versus the, versus the Ravens. That's my bold prediction. 50 yard reception. 50 yard reception. Like, that would be a season long. Close. He said, yeah, he said a couple of 40s, but mm-hmm. hasn't gotten to 50. I think they get one this week. I don't Who's know if it's going to be in like, coverage. Probably nobody, to be honest with you. If I had to take a guess, it, it, like it'll probably be a busted coverage on the, on the Ravens end. That that okay. would probably be my. It'll probably be somebody that's supposed to be there and then just starts jogging after they realize they're beat. <laughs> Up the seam against cover three. Split second. Yeah, who knows, man? I, I I just I think George is um, George has had some explosive plays, so I'm I'm just gonna go ahead and guess that he gets one against this Ravens defense, who's given up more than anybody. <laughs> so. I like it. Uh, let's just let's do the bold predictions, and then we'll get to the game one. So, Alan, you got a bold prediction? I do. Uh, my bold prediction is that Justin Fields plays in this game while Russell Wilson is healthy. Ooh, man. Okay. I like that a lot. Dang. Okay. So we got two offensive ones. I'm going to go with a defensive one, I think, here. I think it's time. I've called this once this year and it didn't happen, but I'm I'm willing to go back to the well. Minka Fitzpatrick, the interceptionless streak, it comes to an end on Sunday. Will that mean that he's a good player again? <laughs> I, I I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I saw the conversations. On, actually, I'm not gonna lie, DB. I think that you kind of changed the narrative with with no. putting out stat on Sunday. I I didn't because I had people DMing me about the stat. Oh so, no. <laughs> Mink is, what? Mink is good. I don't know why that's controversial. I feel well, okay. The reason that I said what I did was I feel like a lot of people all of a sudden, once you put that out, it became a conversation on Twitter where people were all of a sudden like defending him not having an interception. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't but obviously yeah. I don't see your DMs. Yeah, I don't know, man. Like it it feels to me like when you watch them on film that there are certain things in certain areas of the field that you can obviously like not access very often. And that's the only reason I looked up the stat. I didn't stumble on the stat. Like I just, Mm -hmm. that was an anecdotal thing that I wanted to confirm what numbers that my eyes were seeing. Um, And then like true, like too, like I want to give a little bit of credit there. Cause like it was a, in my opinion, it's a Minka stat, but like it's also a Patrick queen stat because like Mm -hmm. uh, Alan mentioned like how susceptible Baltimore has been over the middle of the field. And there is definitely a truth to the fact that Roquan was carrying some of the more difficult linebacker coverage assignments last year. Like Queen himself has talked about that uh, with me. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, like he was a better coverage player that I think a lot of people were giving him credit for. Not that Trenton Simpson hasn't done good things over there and like gave them like a cheaper replacement option. That's cool. Uh, but at the same time, like Queen has been really good in coverage this year. And I think that it's actually covered up some of the struggles from maybe a guy like Peyton Wilson that like people haven't really seen on unless you're like watching the all 22. So, um, but yeah, I mean like the middle of the field for the Steelers, like I, I know it's, I, I remember like, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, like it was always like this routine thing that the Steelers would get torched over the middle because their linebackers couldn't cover. And now like, I feel like that's not the case. Like they've got Minka over there. They got queen and things have been really good. So uh, yeah, Minka's still good. Guys, I promise. Mostly playing zone, which is letting, like them be easy on Dante Jackson and get the most out of him. Like if, if you played over good over the middle, but you had to man everybody up, like you could probably do it, but you're not putting your, then you're giving up stuff on the outside because you're like, I don't think that focus on the middle of the field has taken away from their defense elsewhere. I think it's actually added to it, right? Like they're like, they're just sacrificing the big plays from Minka and queen to maximize everybody else's ability at the same time. It's not like it's there's a penalty they're paying for that somewhere else. I agree. I think it's a little bit overblown. He, and he's getting a pick on Sunday. All right, so game predictions. I would go first for this one. Uh, I've done a bit of waffling on this in terms of who I think is going to get the result. I don't think that this is a uh, you know end-all, be-all, whoever wins this game 100% is winning the division and means the team that loses is not a, a contender. Sure it is. However... This is a game that we are going to look back on. We talked a lot about that Thursday night game between the Bengals and Ravens as a game of the year. This is going to be a game of the year. This is going to be the new one that we're talking about after this one. I'm going 34-31 Steelers walk off Chris Boswell field goal as time expires. I love it. Alan, you going next or y'all want me to go? I'll go next. Um, 
I don't have a great feeling about this game for the Steelers. Uh, they're they're pretty beat up. Boo. I think when you look at the injury report, you should change you, that on the day of. You see Alex Highsmith over there and Jalen Warren over there. In addition to the guys, like the twelve guys the Steelers have out for the year on IR, uh, and then you look at the Ravens, it's like, oh, oh, they don't have Art Millette. How will they get by? Um, I just, uh, I think, uh, I, I don't like that. I think this matchup is going to, like Derek said earlier, require the Steelers' offense to do something they really haven't much, and that's start fast. Um, I think this is a game where the Steelers are going to fall behind and spend the whole rest of the day chasing, which is not what they're built to do. I think they'll get close but not be able to finish a comeback. I'll say Ravens win 30-24. All right. Um, so before I get into my prediction, I want to go on a little bit of a rant really quick um, in my typical fashion. So I tweeted the I think it was after the game on Thursday night, that Ravens Bengals game, which is, you know, a thriller. It was fun to watch uh, a couple bad defenses, a couple really, really great offenses. Um, just to kind of like back up what I was saying, that the Steelers are going to have to score points against this team. I don't know why that's like a hot take. I think some Steelers fans like think that the defense is like so, so elite that they're going to hold every team to like 13 points. And that's just not the case. Um, but the Ravens have actually scored 20 points and had 375 total yards in every game this season. They're the third team in NFL history to do that in the first game, 10 games of a season. Um, according to next-gen stats. So this is a game that Stewart's going to have to score some points. Now, they have done that in recent weeks with Russ. I don't really have, like, anything else to back this up other than, like, Baltimore at this point has to show me that they are not going to melt down against a Mike Tomlin team. After last season's debacle in Pittsburgh, seeing them drop all those passes and just completely melt down in the second half of that game, um, I'm picking the Steelers. Like I, I don't, I, 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 whatever black magic they're doing or whatever, I think that you can make a very easy case that the Balt- that the Baltimore roster is a more talented roster. They've got the MVP at quarterback. I don't care. Like until they show me that they can actually beat the Steelers again, they've the Steelers have won seven of the last eight. Granted, all of them have been one score games. My only prediction is like. I think that this game is going to be close. I think the Steelers can keep it close. And if they do, I trust the Tomlin team more than I trust the Harbaugh team. It just is what it is. So um, hopefully I'm right about that. We'll see. There we go. I like it. So it's Allen that the people can come after unless he changes his prediction. Uh, but he's got he's, he's to put it on record. This, I did change my prediction from, from preseason. I had the Steelers winning this game preseason. Mm. And, and my pick is almost entirely so believing how close these teams are talent wise and the Steelers being significantly more injured right now. That's fair. All right. Let us know how you guys feel about the game in the comments. Of course, uh, DB, before we get out of here, tell the people they can find you. Yep. At Steelers underscore DB on Twitter and on YouTube. And then you can find all of my written work at Steelers. Now.com. There we go. And Alan at a Saunders underscore PGH on X, Instagram, TikTok, and blue sky Steelers. Now.com. It's where you can find all this written work and uh, like subscribe, hit that bell for notifications here on the YouTube channel. So you don't miss an episode of afternoon drive Steelers morning rush sights and sounds post game. And also our new show, which debuts tomorrow, Saturday, if you were listening to this Friday today, if you were listening to this Saturday morning, uh, we'll be with Aaron Becker, our new writer at Steelers. It's going to be called Steelers spotlight It is going to be a conversation between Aaron and someone else. Uh, someone from outside the Steelers now crew. So uh, talking to a former player or a member of the media or someone with a story to tell uh, in sort of an interview format. And I will be interviewing Aaron for the first show. And then I am going to go back to not doing anything on Saturdays. And Aaron is going to (laughs) take over uh, after this week. So make sure you like, subscribe, hit that bell for notifications so you don't miss that on Saturday. And uh, make sure you go over there and watch that and then leave some comments about who you'd like Aaron to talk to for those Mm. Saturday spotlights. There you go. And if you are somebody that listens, whether that's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from, be sure to leave a five-star review and subscribe over there. Just search Steelers Afternoon Drive. Same place you can find us on TikTok, Steelers Afternoon Drive. And then you can find me everywhere, also including Blue Sky, Zachary Smith, PGH. For Derek Bell, Alan Saunders, and myself, thanks for jumping in. Take another ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive. 